The Life and Work of Jesus. This is part 10 in this sermon series. The passage for today is from the Gospel according to Mark. This is in chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. As usual, I will leave the Gospel passage up on the screen while I uh, preach the sermon. Remember, at the end of the last chapter, um, Jesus had been in a town where Jairus uh, had asked him to come and heal his daughter and uh, where he healed the woman in the streets. That was probably Capernaum. So this chapter starts out, Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? They asked, what's this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. I, I want to remind you just uh, about how Jesus taught. I I've said this before. Um, Jesus did not go to school to be a rabbi. He didn't apprentice with another rabbi to study not just the scriptures, but also the commentaries of previous rabbis. Um, he didn't study like a minister studies like I do. So he didn't teach like the rabbis taught. He didn't teach like a professor or like a, an academic or a scholar. He taught to the heart and he taught to what people's lives were actually like and what they actually did and how they actually felt and, uh, and talked and did things. And this is part of why uh, the way he talked was amazing to them. He also talked with authority. He was not afraid to say, you've heard it said, maybe in sermons here before or someone, uh, some rabbi explaining a passage of scripture, you've heard it said, but now I say to you, and he would say something that was intended to be understood as God's word to them, especially since sometimes he changed the interpretation of a passage of scripture. Who but God himself would dare to change the interpretation of a passage of scripture? So this was amazing to people, and, and they were astounded. But look now, he's doing it in his hometown, where he grew up, where he was a child, where he played with the other boys in the village, where he worked for 10, 12, 15 years next to his father in the carpenter shop, where he made furniture for the people in the village. And they're, they're asking, first of all, where did he get this wisdom? He didn't go study with the rabbis. He didn't go to college. What are these remarkable miracles he's performing? We've heard about them everywhere. Don't we know this guy? Isn't this Mary's son? Don't we know his brothers and his sisters? They doubt what he says because they know who he is. And since they know who he is, they're sure that he can't be God. He can't be speaking for God. He can't, he can't be the kind of person who's entitled to say the things that he's saying. This is not unusual. Um, this is not uh, strange. I'm sure that uh, children find this with their own parents. How old do you have to get before your parents believe that you're capable of saying things that are wise, of saying things that are important and valuable? Usually not until you get old enough to have children of your own, but most children are able to occasionally say things that are wise and understanding by the time they're in their teens. Part of this is a problem because we evaluate people on the basis of what we know about them without listening carefully to what they actually say. And of course, the people of Jesus' hometown were offended. He's just like us. He's just another one of us. How dare he try to tell us what to think? How dare he try to tell us what God says?
And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town and among his relatives and in his own home. And he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. A prophet is someone who speaks on behalf of God. A prophet doesn't always tell the future. That's the spectacular part of it that we sometimes see. But if you go through the scripture and, and read uh, the prophets, uh, Moses and the judges of the Old Testament period were considered prophets. And then there's the famous major prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and uh, the other prophets that are called minor prophets, Amos and Joel and... Uh, Hosea and so on, and you look at what they say, very little of what they say is actually a prediction of the future. Most of what they say is to declare what God is saying. Most of what they say is to communicate to the people what God is saying, what God wants them to do, what God is warning them of, and what God wants them to understand and take into account and may be changed because of. Indeed, in the New Testament, it talks about prophecy as one of the spiritual gifts. And in the Protestant churches, we like to say that the gift of prophecy is the gift of the preacher. The preacher sits here, or stands there in the pulpit when we're meeting in person, and tells people not just, not just what the Bible says and what he thinks about it, but sometimes, what God's word is to people, and what God's word is to this people right here in this congregation, and sometimes what God is, God's word is to this nation and to this culture at this point in history. This makes the preacher a prophet. The prophets of the Bible are the examples of what it means to be a prophet. The prophets in the Bible are the link and the the foundation and the archetype of what it means to be a prophet. But Paul says in one of his letters, he says, I wish that you all would prophesy. I wish that everyone would speak God's word to one another, would notice and incorporate into their own hearts and their own thoughts, and then speak out loud to one another what God is saying, what God wants what God is doing, and sometimes what God demands. And it says here that Jesus couldn't do any miracles there. I, I don't think we should interpret that as Jesus couldn't do any miracles in the sense that he no longer had any miraculous power, but rather we've seen already in Mark when Jesus is doing miracles just in the last sermon, he does them in order to reinforce people's faith, in order to help them understand what God is doing with them in order that they can trust God and be changed. And that's what the miracles are for, and that's how they work. So if people don't believe them, don't believe him, if people don't trust him, if people don't have faith, then he can't do miracles for them. Not because he couldn't do them, but because they wouldn't work. They wouldn't make things happen. They wouldn't change people's lives because the people don't trust him. And he was amazed that they didn't trust him because I'm sure that before he went off and was baptized by John and became a religious nut, that he was probably a respected person in Nazareth, the kind of person that people thought, yeah, Jesus, the carpenter, he does good work. He's honest. He doesn't cheat people. and and he's actually got a good word now and then. I presume that Jesus lived the kind of life that people would have thought that about before he started carrying out his ministry and preaching the kingdom of God and telling people what God's word was and what God expected of them, him. So he might have expected, he might have hoped that people would trust him they knew him. You usually trust people that you know well. But here, when he started doing his ministry, 
and preaching as he preached in his ministry, now they stopped trusting him because they said to himself, hey, he's just another ordinary guy. He can't possibly be speaking for God. You all know that I'm not just a minister, I'm also a theologian that I've studied. And one of the theologians I studied was a man named Karl Barth. And one of the things Barth said early in his ministry is he said, look, preachers are called to speak the word of God. Now, mind you, the word of God is not a word that is about God. The word of God is the word that God speaks. And preachers are called to speak the word of God, to say the word that God is saying. On the other hand, preachers are human, sinful people, just like everybody else. And they can't possibly speak the word that God is speaking. They might be able to say a word about God, but how can mere human beings speak the word that God is speaking? So what are we to do about this if we are preachers? How can we do our duty to proclaim God's word in full consciousness that we don't have the ability to speak God's word? And the answer is, we do what we're called to do. We do what we're ordered to do. We obey the command of God to speak his word, even though we're not able to. And actually, the fact that we're not able to is an important part, is an important part of what it means to speak God's word. Because what people need to hear is, my God, I know him. And he can't possibly say this, and yet he is saying it. And when I hear it, I hear God speaking. Therefore, it is God speaking, because it can only be the word of God by a miracle. And if I'm hearing God now, when he preaches, that's not because he's that good a preacher. It's because God is working a miracle using his words, working a miracle in my heart that I hear these words working a miracle in my life that these words are changing me. The inability of preachers as human beings to speak the word of God highlights the word of God itself as being the word God speaks when people hear it and recognize it as a miracle. Well, going back then to what Paul says in, in one of his letters in uh, 1 Corinthians, that I wish that you all would prophesy. I wish that you all would preach. I, me, this Paul here, as a pastor of our church, I wish for you all to preach. I wish for you all to proclaim the word of the Lord. I wish for you all to recognize that you can't do it in your own power, by your own ability, but that God commands you to give witness to what you've seen God doing, to give witness to what you've heard God say, and to say it again to those around you, to your family, to your friends, and to the people in the culture and the nation around you. All of you should be doing this from time to time. And if you do it, Sometimes it'll be the case that the people who know you best will doubt it most because the people who don't know you at all will only hear what you say. And if you're saying what God says, then they'll hear it as what God says. And since they don't know you, they'll hear only that God says this thing, that they hear God speaking through you. So they'll take you seriously. But your own family will hear you speak about not being angry and uh, not hating, and will say, wait a minute, I've seen him yell and scream at us. Your own family will hear you speaking about what's right to do, and will say, wait a minute, I've seen him do all sorts of wrong things. It may sometimes be that the people who know you best, your friends and family, will hear you least, but that doesn't matter. You're responsible to speak God's word anyway. Now, it's not that hard. It's not that hard 
to speak the word of the Lord. This is why we read the Bible. This is why we pray together. This is why we worship together so that we become familiar with the word of the Lord, so that we come to understand it, so that we come to recognize that we can proclaim it. When someone puts a Black Lives Matter sign on their front yard, they're proclaiming the word of the Lord. When you see wrong and bad being done in society around you and you speak up and you say in your Facebook post, hey, this is not just a hello, I got to say this. These protests are telling the truth about something that's wrong in our nation. When you look at what's going on in the world around you and say, God doesn't approve of what they're doing in Hong Kong right now. That couldn't possibly be God's will. Maybe there's some things mixed up about how things are to be understood and how they're not to be understood, but at least this is wrong. This doesn't just go for things that are wrong either. Sometimes the word of the Lord is meant to encourage and to identify and to point out the things that are good and the things that are right and the things that are important. Look, these people are going down to Elijah's promise and they're serving food to the poor. These people are helping open the church on winter nights and letting homeless men sleep there. This is what God has called us to do. This is the word of the Lord that we ought all to do these things. We all of us know a great many things that if we think about them, we are sure that they are the word of the Lord. And it is our part to proclaim them and to say them again, not to be shy, not to say, well, I think that God kind of means this, and maybe if you know someone looked at it, they'd realize it too. Now, sometimes it's your job to look and to point and say, see, she's taking care of the sick, even though she's at risk of her own life by doing so. This is God's will. This is the kind of person who is approved of by God. This is how God wants us to behave. We need to recognize that we are all called to be prophets, even if, like Jesus, we're not recognized and accepted sometimes, even if, like Jesus, we may later be rejected entirely. But we do this not by our own strength, not by our own power, but because we have discovered, recognized, and accepted the word of the Lord, and having accepted it, been changed by it, and having been changed by it, become responsible for speaking it. You are all prophets, all of you. I really believe this. This is not just a theoretical thing to me. This is not just a theoretical thing to me. I look at some of the posts by Andrew the Younger, Andrew Chang, and I see here this young man, he can't help but speak out about what he sees as injustice. And I'm just so happy to see him do that. I'm so excited. That's the kind of thing I want all of us to do. All of us to do. And I see most of us doing some of it from time to time. But I speak here as the preacher to say more of us should be doing it more often. And I can't tell you which specific things you should do. If you're capable of speaking the word of the Lord, you're also capable of recognizing which word belongs to you to speak. By the Holy Spirit, God is in your heart. By the Holy Spirit, your mind has been changed. By the Holy Spirit, you will know and find out which things are right for you to speak. All I can do as the preacher is make suggestions, give examples, and encourage you to use your own wisdom and your own judgment and your own understanding to see what places you must speak up and to speak up in them. And I'll tell you that right now, the world is in a mess. This pandemic that's going on, in addition to making people sick and killing them, has also exposed 
the brokenness in our societies. It's exposed the ways we don't take care of one another and don't help one another. It's possible that this pandemic is part of what made it possible for the Black Lives Matter movement to grow strong in this time and place because it's broken and shown us the brokenness of the ways we work and live together. This is a hard time. Our politics is broken. Even the people in politics that I think are trying to do good things are trying to do those good things in sometimes nasty ways. The world is broken right now. And as God's people, you're responsible for trying to heal it and for seeing the truth and speaking it. There's no lack of opportunity right now to see and speak the truth, to see and speak God's word. So spend some time in prayer when you're at home by yourself during the week and ask God to show you clearly what it's your responsibility to speak up and say. Amen.